you for the word today. Uh, we're going to have some fun today. You're, uh, if you're a guest today, just get ready because we're going to just jump into the deep end. And, uh, and if you brought a guest today and you're like, why did he pick this Sunday to teach on the Holy Spirit? Don't worry because I'm going to explain well. And I think you are going to be shocked at how much religion has blinded our understanding and our eyes from the true purpose of why we're on this earth and what it means to be a child of God. There's much more to experience. If you're bored serving Jesus, can I just encourage you? You're not doing it right. Uh, because serving the Lord is not bored. It's an adventure in faith. And uh, man, there's victory to victory, glory to glory we go to. So I'm going to jump right into this today. And we're going to start out with a little uh, icebreaker here because I want to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page. And we have our youth in here today. So I actually want to, uh, I'm going to ask for a uh, high school age, well, junior high or high school, our youth group, uh, volunteer today. And I know that if I ask for a volunteer without giving something away, they probably won't raise their hand in the adult service. So you're going to get $20 if you volunteer and you accomplish the purpose here. So junior high or high school student, one that would volunteer, uh, 20 bucks. Do I need to go to 40, 60, 80? No, $20. Come on, I need somebody. Okay, come up here. All right, here we go. This is, uh, it's too late now. You can't turn back. Uh, <laughs> once you find out. What's your name? Jaden. Y'all give Jaden a hand. All right. Jaden. I hope. Okay, good. He's outgoing. That word, this is going to work out perfect. Okay. So uh, we are going to do an example here that's going, trust me, it'll preach with the sermon today. But I want y'all to catch this. So we're going to play charades. Have you ever played charades? Okay. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're in part two of the Holy Spirit series. And I'm going to just whisper it. I think it's charades. It's charades where you act out something and your people have to guess it. Okay, because there's Pictionary. That's drawing. Anyways, I get them all mixed up. Okay, this is where you act it out. Okay, you don't have to draw. So I'm going to tell you something. No, one's gonna, no one knows about this. And then you're going to have to, um, let's go over here out front. We're going to get on camera. The whole world will see you. And then you're going to act out what I tell you. And then uh, you get $20 if they guess what you're acting out. See, there's a caveat to this. Okay, so if they guess it. Okay, so I'm going to whisper near what he's going to act out. You guys are going to have to participate. So you need to be guessing, like give energy. Don't just make them stand here in total silence and move around like crazy. Okay. You can't say anything. You can't draw anything. You just have to act it out. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be hard. And that's why he said what? Okay. So y'all give him a hand one more time. Let's encourage him. All right, Jaden, let's have them guess what you are. Go ahead. You've got a few moments here. They're getting it, so... Wow, Michael, you're so smart. A shaved cat flying an airplane. Y'all give Jaden a hand. Thank you so much. <laughs> Michael, you're such a genius. I don't know why anyone else didn't get that. All right. So, I was going to save him from spending 30 minutes up there going, no, say it in order. Okay. Why did we say that? Because the Bible says, no, I'm kidding. A shaved cat flying an airplane. Because I wanted to make sure it was awkward for him. Okay. But it had to be hard. Here's what I want you to see. There's no significance of a shade cat flying an airplane. But let me tell you this. The confusion. When you're playing charades and somebody, have you ever been the person acting it out and you said this is the easiest one ever, you knew you were going to get a point, and none of your teammates, especially if it's family, never play with family because it causes a lot of drama. At least play with enemies at least, you know. But you're, you're so frustrated because they're just not getting it. They cannot interpret what you're trying to show them. Uh, let me just tell you how simple this is. Let's just pretend that um, God or his call for your life, the plan of God for your life is like Jaden here trying to say, look, 
I'm, I'm trying to show you what the season is. Have you ever been in a season where you're like, God, I can't hear your voice and I really need to right now. What are you trying to tell me to do? And you're the audience and you're trying to interpret everything that's happening in your life. And I would have just represented the Holy Spirit saying, hey, let me make it real easy for you. I'll reveal to you exactly what God is trying to say and want you to do and what you're called to do. Here's what I'm saying. If you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you are protected and insulated from confusion and from deception. You will know exactly what God's calling you to do. You'll be in the timing of God for your life. It's not a guesswork. Serving God is not guessing. Aren't you glad you don't have to hope and wonder and try to figure out what God wants you to do? Here's what God told me years ago. He said, Jason, never assume anything for the rest of your life. Assumption is always wrong when it comes to the call of God for your life. You don't have to assume. He said, I'll tell you, ask me. And it's funny because how many decisions do we make? We just try to weigh the good and the bad. We make an assumption and hope it's the right decision instead of consulting God. So as we talk about the Holy Spirit today, I want to just hone in on some of the roles of, of the Holy Spirit in our life and really highlight a few things. He will reveal all truth, the Bible says to us, John 16, 13. So he's the one who guides us, the Bible says, into truth. So you don't have to play guesswork. Now I want to read two scriptures here, and we're just going to kind of jump into this. And I believe you're going to learn something today. And some of you might be surprised at what you hear in this sermon. Because when I say Holy Spirit, it depends on if you've grown up in church, what denomination you came from uh, might be how you perceive the Holy Spirit. If you didn't grow up in church, you might just have a picture in your mind of a televangelist or something you saw on TV or something you saw someone do. I mean, you might have some random idea. We're going to let God define for us the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives today. And I'm going to shock you with two scriptures to start out with here because I like doing this. In Revelation chapter 1, we're going to read verses 4 through 6. And we're going to find out what the purpose of the church and the children of God are on the earth. Why are we here? Jesus gives us a clue here. Revelation chapter 1 verses four through six. It says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead. And he's the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now, when I first read that, I would just assume, oh, the kings of the earth is simply just talking about the ruler of over the, the kings or the leaders of the earth. But we're going to find out who he defines as kings here in just a moment. It goes on in verse 5 to say, to him, speaking of Jesus, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, verse 6, and has made us, say made us. Okay, that we're going to define you. This is scripture defining who we are. Kings and, say and. Okay, so we're, we're getting two labels here that Jesus, through Scripture, is defining his church. He has made us kings and priests to God and to his God and Father. To him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we see here that we are kings and priests. And now we see Jesus is ruler of the kings of the earth. When I say kings, I mean kings and queens. I'm talking plural here, like saying mankind is man and woman, right? So the kings of the earth. He's speaking of royalty and dominion here. So here's a revelation I want you to see. When it comes to our relationship with God, how we relate to God in this life, we relate to him not only as children but as priests. Priests serve uh, God. Priests serve in the temple. So we worship God. The priests were in charge of the worship. We serve him in our lives. But here's what I want you to see. Very different because this is not religion now. This is the word and kingdom. We serve God or relate to him as priests, but we relate to to the earth as kings, the Bible tells us. That means we're not just supposed to be religious examples of Jesus on the earth. If he's a king and we are his body and he's the head, the body of Christ, then our relationship on earth, the outlook we should have is not just a religious mindset, but a kingly mindset. That means authority. That means you don't need, what's the Bible say? We are above and not beneath. Because kings are above and not beneath. We're 
children of the king. That means we're royalty. So now your confidence comes from who you are and not what you do or what other people think you are. You are our royalty and we're kings in the earth. Let me read Romans 5, 17 because there's more scriptures just so you know I'm not making all this up. Romans 5, 17, the Amplified says, for if because of one man's trespass, speaking of Adam, death reigned through that one much more. Surely those who receive God's overflowing, overflowing grace and the free gift of righteousness, putting them in right standing with himself, will reign as kings in life. You notice it didn't just say in heaven one day. It says in life through the one man, Jesus. Once again, as priests, we serve God, but as kings, Jesus says we're kings and priests, we expand his kingdom by reigning in the earth. That means in every season of your life, you don't need to just see how can I exist and survive this season. We are more than survivors. We're overcomers, the Bible calls us. So it's not just surviving season to season. It's thriving, overcoming, and being in authority in every season of life. Authority means you determine the outcome and not the circumstance. Let me give you a note for you here. You can't choose your circumstances but you can choose how you go through your circumstances and if you get through your circumstances and how you get through your circumstances. In other words, you can either exist through them or you can overcome. They can end in victory or defeat every time. It's how we see ourselves. So if we expand God's kingdom in the earth, we're called Light Church for a reason. Because I wanted us to get out of the mindset of Sunday morning is the big event. Sunday morning is what Christianity is all about. We just have good services, good worship. We encourage each other. We look spiritual. We put on a mask, and we all say all the right things, and then we go crazy Monday through Saturday, and we limp into Sunday next week to get charged back up so we can make it until next Sunday. No, the main thing is Monday morning through Saturday. Sunday is charge up in faith, and then the real work starts when you leave this building. It's how we see it. Now, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit today, and we're going to have some fun because uh, there's a lot of exciting things we're going to talk about. But one of the things I want to tell you, just so you can understand where I'm going, is we, we learned last week that the Holy Spirit executes the will of the kingdom of God. He is just as much God as God the Father and God the Son. God is one. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but he's three persons. And, and we tried to explain that last week. I'll go into a little bit more. But he really executes or accomplishes God's will. So you notice in Genesis 1, it says there was chaos and darkness in the earth. And the Holy Spirit was hovering over the chaos and darkness. Nothing happened while the Holy Spirit was hovering. It wasn't until God the Father spoke, let there be light, then the Holy Spirit created light. Why? He was waiting on the word of God, which is God's will. And he brings to pass with the power that he has the will of God wherever he goes. And we learned last week that if we're a part of a kingdom and not a religion, the Holy Spirit would be like the role of a governor in a kingdom. Not, not a governor in a democracy or republic. And so don't think about American governors of states. A governor in a kingdom it represents the king in every way and has the authority of the king in everything. And in the kingdom of God, he is the king because they're one. And he goes to a territory. So if a, a kingdom takes over a territory, they send a governor to the territory. And the governor, wherever the governor goes is kingdom ter territory. But they take the culture of the kingdom, the language of the kingdom, the history of the kingdom, the atmosphere of the kingdom. And the governor's in charge of now uh, revealing and setting up the culture of the king home kingdom in the territory. So the Holy Spirit is on the earth. People say, where's Jesus? In my heart. Well, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is in your heart. And he is the governor of the kingdom of God. And his job is to exemplify, execute, and make the realities of God's kingdom come through your life. So that's his role. Wherever the Holy Spirit's leading, the kingdom of God's in authority. Let me say this. If the Holy Spirit is not leading areas of your life, then God's kingdom, God is not in authority in that area. So if the Holy Spirit is leading in your marriage, guess what? Your marriage is under God's authority. And whatever's under God's authority is under his provision. It's under his protection, right? Anything that God has, he's responsible for. Anything you have that you won't give God, guess what? You're responsible for it. 
If I gave you the keys to my car and said, I'm going out of town for a week, and let's just say by faith that I have a really nice sports car, I don't know, like something really fast, I'll, Lamborghini for any of them, really. Just anything Italian would be nice, but any really nice car. Let's just say I had a very expensive Rolls Royce, it doesn't matter. And I gave you the keys. I'm like, this is a very high-end car. I'm trusting you. Here's the keys. I'm going out of town for a week. You can drive it and everything and just make sure that you keep up with it because those high-end cars are more maintenance. You know, some of them you got to like plug the battery in every day. There's all kind of stuff. So I need you to take care of it. Now, if I come back in town a week later and you drive up my Lamborghini, okay, just, I mean, this beautiful spotless car that has less than a thousand miles on it and you've got a scratch from the very back fender all the way to the headlights on one side of the car. There's a flat tire on the front. One of the headlights is broken out. You've got a crack down the front windshield. Guess what's going to happen? Bad things, right? No, but if I, if I see that, what am I going to do? I am going to ask you to give account for what you did with my car. Like, I know that I didn't mess that up, so you made a mistake and somehow lost control of leading this situation, and my car is destroyed. Why? Because you had possession of it. Even though it's my car, you were in possession of it, so you're the one that was responsible for it, all right? Same thing spiritually. We're like, God, bless my marriage. Help me with my marriage, Lord. Yeah, give me your marriage. Let me lead in your marriage. No, Lord, too scared to do that. I just want you to bless it in my hand. Just touch it. Don't grab it. Just touch it, Lord, and just, yes, right there, Lord. Lord, my money, Lord, my body, whatever it is, we hold it. We ask God to bless it. Don't take it. Just bless it, Lord. I'll honor you with it, but it's still mine. Guess what? You're responsible for everything, providing the health of that. Why? Because it's not in his authority. We have to choose to submit the areas of our life to the authority of God. You know, Jesus can be Savior and not Lord. We always say Lord and Savior, but they, they don't go together like automatically. Like you can have a revelation of who Jesus is and you're like, you're the man, you're my Savior and you're the Lord of my life. And he goes, really? Because it was 30% of your life I'm not the Lord of. You got to submit that to him. Guess what? God's covering comes upon what he's an authority over. Whatever's led by the Holy Spirit is under the authority of God. All right, I hope you're ready for this. It's in the Bible, so don't get mad at me. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 21. Romans 8, 14 through 21. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters, the children, the sons of God. Now, when I read that scripture years ago, that scared me a little bit. Let's be honest for just a second, all those that are children of God. How many of you can say there are seasons of your life where you're not led by the Spirit of God? Let's just be honest. Let's all. Okay. If you interpret the scripture the way I did originally, as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the children of God. Well, I know there have been times in my life, seasons, where I was not led by the Spirit of God. Does that mean you lose your salvation? You're not a child anymore? What does it mean? Well, we got to go to the Greek for this. I'm trying to go slow before I get to the punchlines here. I want you to catch this. For as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the children or the sons of God. That word sons or children there in Greek means this, mature children. There's another word in Greek that just means biological children. So there's a difference between just being a biological, if you will, for lack of better words, child of God. I'm born again. I, my faith is in Christ and being a mature child of God. And the Bible says the mature children of God are the ones, here's how you recognize them, they're led by the Holy Spirit. The immature babies who are only on milk are not sensitive to his voice. And I mean, babies aren't led by much, just desire and hunger and whatever, interest, right? I mean, the, word, the scariest time, parents, I don't want to freak you out, you know, if this is your first child, but man, when they start moving on their own, that's when you lock down everything right? You plug in all the, the plugs. How many parents remember your first child, how you overdid it with everything, right? I mean, you're so worried. Did anyone else but me check to make sure they were breathing at night? Am I the only one? I mean, I'd get, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and be like, I mean, we just had, we had no kids, two boys. All of a sudden, every night I was worried about something. I was like, what are they doing? Did they roll over the wrong way? What happened? You know, and you're just overthinking it so much, right? But you, you protect them from everything when they start moving because now they can get into things that could cause damage, 
like the, the cabinets with poison and yard stuff and, you know, whatever it is, cleaning agents, you definitely lock that down. Then you got to make sure that they can't open any of the doors where they don't need to be. And you definitely don't want them putting, you know, knives in the socket. So every socket is blocked. Why? Because now they're active and they're moving around. But an immature baby or a child is led by interest, by desire, by uh, hunger. It's just their five senses lead them. A mature person is not moved by everything that happens around them. They make decisions that are wise based upon understanding and knowledge and not just by feelings or emotions. Have you ever talked to someone who very, very old? You know, I mean, that's, I'm going to leave it right there, just old, right? There's old people. Here's the thing about old people. They don't get stressed out easily. I mean, my grandmother, I remember she's 92 years old. Like, they have a perspective and a vision on life that is so different than we do when we're younger. It's like, ah, it's no big deal. Hey, it'll be all right. Why? They've lived through some things where they realize that you're making a mountain out of a molehill. I'm telling you, I've been there and I've been on the other side of it. You'll be fine. I remember going to people with twin babies going, it, it, does it get easier? This surely cannot be. I mean, this, this has to be the hardest season right now because I don't know if we can do it. I definitely don't want any more kids at this point. Can I get through this? You know, and we'd talk to other twin parents and they would say, and, the, and baby, uh, when they had older days, and they'd go, Actually, it gets harder. I hate to tell you that, but it's a lot more work with twins. Uh, you, you just, you know, ask God why he gave you twins, but you got to figure it out, right? I mean, it's double everything. I remember at night, one would get hungry and need to eat, and it's not like you can just take care of them. They wake the other one up, then they're both upset, and we can't take turns because we have one each. It was every man for himself. So I was like, you get Cole, I'll get Austin, or whatever it was, and we're taking care of that child, right? So there's, so, there's such a high level of need right there, and we're just trying to keep them going. Maturity is not based on the five physical senses. So being led by the Holy Spirit represents maturity. Okay, let's keep reading here because I want to get to this point. Verse 15 in Romans 8. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. How do you know you're a child of God? The Holy Spirit reveals that to you on the inside. Verse 17. And if children of God, then we're heirs of God. Now, think of that statement, heirs of God. You know, don't you want to be an heir of a very rich person on this earth? You know, like, I mean, you might have an aunt or an uncle or someone you never... I mean, I've heard stories of people. I heard one of the most amazing stories. There were, I'm not going to go into it, but it was a homeless guy, and he, at the, uh, he was on the street, and his uncle that he never knew, had no children, passed away and was a multimillionaire, and he, they found this guy on the street... And they were saying, you have an inheritance. And the story is amazing. And long story short, the guy never responded to the inheritance, never opened the letter. And he died on the street without realizing his inheritance. And this is a true story. And I think, how many children of God live like that? We are children of the King, the Father. And we are heir to everything God has and is. That's the Bible, not me. And we don't, by faith, receive all that God has for us in this life. It goes on in verse 17 to say, If we're heirs of God, then we're joint heirs with Christ. Co-heirs, Scripture says. If indeed we suffer with him, we will also be glorified together with him. Verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Here we go, listen. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the What's creation waiting for? You ready? Revealing of the sons or the children of God. Creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in this hope, that creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now it goes on to talk about the final resurrection when we get new bodies. And speaking of creation will be redeemed when the church is revealed for who it is and we get the redemption of our bodies, even animals. Like physical creation knows, this is the Bible, it's waiting. Even the earth itself is groaning and waiting for the children of God to be revealed in the final resurrection. Now here's what I want you to see. <clears throat> we'll learn in Scripture... I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but I'll, I'll give you these scriptures in a moment where you'll see that that revelation of the children of God is not just one time at the very end when we get our new bodies when Jesus comes back. The manifestation of the sons and daughters of God is progressive, scripture shows us. Let me just make this really simple. 
the entire world is waiting for the church to step up and be who the church is supposed to be in the earth. Because if the body of Christ is fulfilling its purpose according to how God has called us, what we're called to do, the whole world will enter into a season of freedom and redemption if we're who we're called to be. That means there's so much more than you're experiencing. The life of a Christian is not to just be faithful and go to church and try to do your best and sin to very minimal. The lowest percentage of sin you can get, and the older you get, you can kind of lower it 1% a year till you get to 5%, and then you're a really mature Christian. It has nothing. You're missing understanding all of it. Religion has deceived us. The purpose of the children of God is to reveal the kingdom of God in the earth. The great commission is go into the world and take this gospel of the kingdom to the world. You preach the gospel, but your life speaks louder than your mouth. So it's not just saying the gospel, it's showing people the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't just say God is good and loves you. Jesus said it and he showed people the love of the Father. He said, oh, blind eyes right here? Let me show you what God looks like. He cares. In Jesus' name, open blind eyes. Raise the dead. Went into the darkest of moments of people's life and revealed the kingdom of God to them and said, here's what the Father looks like. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The the way I act, how I see people, the compassion that I have is an exact representation of God the Father. He cares that much. So if we're his body, guess what? Our lives are meant to reveal the kingdom of God. Not just in how we act, but what God does in our lives. All right, here's what reveal means. Reveal means to show, exhibit, put on display, or manifest. All of creation is waiting on the children of God to be manifested, the Bible says. That means your neighborhood is waiting on you to step up. The government, you can complain all day about the federal government. Guess what? It's waiting on you. We can complain, but maybe we have a role. You know, it's like in church when someone comes to me and says, Pastor, you know, we, we, in the church, we really need this. We, I, why don't we have this? And they, like, bring up, like, a, a deficit, and they say we want it. I'm like, guess what? God put that in you, and that passion for that is in you. That's why you're asking me. Guess what? You're nominated. Let's do it, right? Why? Because you, let me tell you, what frustrates you the most is probably what you're called to change. If you get, I mean, there's one thing that gets me. I said it earlier. I don't know why I'm this way. I, I, I'm, I mean, I was a youth pastor years ago, but the innocence of a child, the purity of a child is something that I, the enemy is out to destroy and to take from a child, and it makes me angry. I mean, I don't care what it is. The way the world puts all this stuff and social media is just children need to be children while they're children. They don't need to be 30 years old and grown up at six years old. So to protect that. But guess what? I'm passionate about it. Some of you are like, oh, okay, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. But I get angry about it at night. You know, like I'm like, and guess what? I'm doing things to make a difference in that world. Why? Because I'm called to be a part of that change. So what what is inside of you? What is that passion? What irritates you? You're the, the answer's in you. The kingdom's in you. So we have the answer in us. So this is a progressive revelation. Now, here's what I want you to see. We learned earlier what children the earth is waiting for. The Bible says the mature children of God, all of creation is waiting on them to be revealed or manifested. Now, let me just tell you something. God, if it's the mature children, that Greek word, and not just biological, then God only manifests sons and not babies. So if God's going to put you on a pedestal and say, here, I'm going to exalt you in due season, the Bible says, after you humble yourself, he manifests mature sons and daughters of God, not babies. I don't give a baby the keys to the car and go, my children, I was like, man, I love you so much, son. At two years old, I'm gonna show you how much dad loves you. Here's my car. Go, drive it, enjoy it. I love you that much. Why? Because they can't handle it. It'll bring destruction. I love them. I'd give my life for them, but they're not ready. God manifests mature children and not babies. How are they manifested? Here's what I want you to hear. If you listen quickly, I can say this quickly. The role of the Holy Spirit is to prepare the church for the manifestation as the church. He's the one who convicts of sin, the Bible says. He's the one who helps take the character of Christ and form it in our life. It's called the fruits of the Spirit. He's the one who prepares us. Philippians 1, 6 says this, Be confident of this very thing, that he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So God reveals himself in the earth through the church. The gospel doesn't, God doesn't 
come out of heaven and preach the gospel and take it all around the world. He said, you take this gospel and bring it to the world. If my kingdom will be seen in the earth, I'm going to have it seen through the church. Jesus went to the right hand of God and said, now you're my hands and feet. You're my mouthpiece. You represent me. Go into all the world. He manifests himself in the earth. Listen, Jesus didn't just come to bring heaven to us. Listen, he came to bring heaven through us. A swamp only has intake. My wife's from Louisiana. There's lots of swamps in Louisiana. If you like fishing... Louisiana is definitely the place to go. But there are a lot. What is a swamp? A swamp has only intake and everything begins to die, if you will. It's just stagnant water. A river, flowing water, right? A river has movement to it. If you're going to have to drink fresh water from somewhere in the wild, I would suggest picking a river at the highest peak in Colorado than a swamp at the lowest peak by the Gulf, right? Why? Fresh and flowing. So heaven is meant to move through the church and not just salvation's for us. Guess what? You will get spiritually fat. You will get spiritually stinky. Have you ever been around someone that says they're a Christian and they stink? I don't mean physically. I mean attitude. You're like, man, nobody. Surely you're not telling people you're serving Jesus because nobody will want to serve Jesus if you're the example of Jesus, right? Or have you been that person before? You know, you're like, man, I am not the best example. It's because there's a difference between just taking in and giving out. The Holy Spirit is bringing heaven through the church. Now, here's the two points of my sermon. This is going to be good. Number one, how does the Holy Spirit interact with believers? What is his role in our life? Number one, he interacts with us or works within us. Number one is within us. Within us. What does that mean? salvation, sanctification, becoming like Christ, the gospel message, the Holy Spirit revealed Jesus to us. But here's what I want you to see. Within us, he reveals the fruits of the kingdom of God from in us, within us, to the outside. What are the fruits? You know, they're called the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Through the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So all of these character traits of the king, the fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit does a work inside of us, which is cultivate the fruits of the Spirit so they're seen in our lives. Could you use more patience in your life, love in your life, kindness in your life? When you're walking with the Holy Spirit, and that sounds funny, but guess what? Some of us look that way spiritually. We're like, ah, I got to be more love. Ah, I I shouldn't do that. You're like, ah, I got to be more kind. Ah, I got to be more patient. And you're trying trying to force yourself to fit into this mold of looking like Jesus. And you're trying to be Jesus on your own. Guess what? You have your life in your hands and you're trying to beautify it and show God how good and disciplined you are. And look, I'm gonna make the fruits of the spirit work in my life. I'm gonna get under condemnation when I don't walk in love. As soon as I make a mistake in that area, I'm going to beat myself up and try to get better in that area. Guess what? If you're walking with Jesus and the Holy Spirit is leading you, they're the fruits of the Spirit, not the fruits of the believer. So it's not you producing those fruits. It's having a relationship with the Spirit of God inside of you and letting Him lead your life. Love is a byproduct. Patience is a byproduct. If I read the fruits of the Spirit and you're like, don't have that, don't have that, don't have 2% of that, don't have that, don't have that. I've read them before and thought, man, I am not saved. I don't know what's going on. I have none of these. It's not that you're not saved. It's that you haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to produce fruit in your life, and you're that apple tree trying to squeeze out things. So, number one, the Holy Spirit works within us by uh, working the fruits of the Spirit. He births salvation in us, sanctification, becoming more like Christ. He leads our lives into more Christ-likeness. So when he's leading, your life will begin to look more like Jesus. The fruits of the Spirit reveal the character of God in the earth. But he also, not just within us, but he also works upon our lives. Within our lives, fruits of the Spirit, salvation, sanctification, upon our life are the gifts of the Spirit, power and manifestation. There's a difference. Now, for some of you theologians, I'm going to give you the scriptures to study it later because I don't want to take the time and confuse everybody here. But I'm just going to tell you, very, the Bible is very clear that there is a difference between the Holy Spirit being in you and upon you. 
And when you said yes to Jesus and put your faith in him, the Bible teaches over and over that the Holy Spirit is in you if you're a child of God at salvation. But the Bible talks about another experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says he's not only in you anymore, he's upon you. Now, here's for the theologians to study later. John chapter 20, verse 22. Jesus had already raised from the dead. That means now he has created a new species of being called believer, children of God, Christians, children of God. Because when he rose from the dead and defeated death, now anyone whose faith is in him, our old, old passes away, all things become new. They're a new creation in Christ. He's already died and rose again. He comes to the disciples, walks through the wall in John 20. He's already been raised from the dead. They're all having dinner. Can you imagine that? Why did he walk through the wall and not through a door? He does everything for a reason. Jesus is showing, a, saying a lot more by his actions sometimes than just what you're reading. He could have opened the door and knocked on it, but instead he walks through the wall. John 20, that's pretty cool. I could go into that forever because I love physics and I love all that. That's for another sermon. Walks through the wall and then he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. John 20, 22. They receive the Holy Spirit. They're his disciples. Their faith is in him. Then in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, Jesus says something else. He talks to the same disciples and says, go to Jerusalem and tarry there and wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Well, if he had already given them the Holy Spirit and they received him inside, then why are they waiting for the Holy Spirit? Because he was very particular. He said, wait for the Spirit to come upon you. And when he does, he will give you power to be my witnesses in the earth. They already had. So guess what? If, you, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit's in you. But there's a difference between drinking water and jumping in a swimming pool. Drinking water is like, oh, I agree with water. Oh, water's good. Yes, water's inside of me. Jumping into a pool is like, I love water, right? I mean, you're just like immersed in water. It's all around you. It envelops your life. The Holy Spirit's in us, but is he leading us? Is he a part of every area of our life? Is his overflowing presence operating and free in every area of our life? Or are we just saved and have him deep in a little corner in our heart somewhere? So the two area ways the Holy Spirit works in a believer's life is within us through the fruits of the Spirit and upon us the gifts of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit reveal the character of God. The gifts of the Spirit reveal the kingdom or the authority of God in the earth. So the fruits of the Spirit, I already talked to them about you. Jesus revealed the Father. Now our turn is to reveal Jesus in the earth. How do we do that? The Holy Spirit reveals his fruits. The gifts of the Spirit, though, are how the authority of the King are shown. What did Jesus go around and do? He didn't just say, I'm Jesus and I'm here. He said, hey, I'm going to tell you about the Father, but I'm also going to show you the Father. So he operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He opened blind eyes. He had words of knowledge. He walked up you know, to someone, a woman, and he said, uh, she said, oh, I've, my, my husband I'm, is not here. And he goes, you've been married five times, man. She didn't tell him that. She's like, I perceive you're a prophet, the Bible says. Yeah, I bet so. I mean, imagine how accurate. So the gifts of the Spirit are moving through Jesus, and that's the Holy Spirit's power operating, showing the kingdom of God. Our lives should preach louder than our words, and religion has just put the whole kingdom into just words of man and not demonstration. But Paul said the kingdom of God is not just in the words of man's wisdom, but it's in demonstration and power by the Holy Spirit. So it's, and I don't mean weirdness. Now, when I say gifts of the Spirit, you might have a picture in your mind of what that looks like. Can I just tell you something kind of shocking? The gifts of the Spirit are, are not, I would, we can argue this in Scripture. I would say 50-50, but they're not just primarily for the church. I mean, when Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, he's talking about with in mind the lost. If a lost person comes in, do this. If you're prophesying and you read their mail, that lost person will put their faith in Christ. He's saying these gifts are to show the world the kingdom of God. So that means they're for Walmart lines. They're for the cubicle at your job. They're for your neighborhood. They're not for some preacher on stage only, even though God can do it in a service, saying, wow, look what God can do. We're meant to show the kingdom everywhere. God's not weird. People are weird. So if you've seen weirdness in the name of God, that's because that's a weird dude. Or that's a weird girl. But when you see Jesus for who he is, everybody wants him because they're seeing him. So I want you to get past these preconceived ideas. We are called to reveal the kingdom of God in this earth. Holy Spirit does it in us and through our lives. Now, I won't go into this. We'll do it in another sermon. The gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can read that later. But I want you to see the purpose are to make us witnesses. Now, I want you to see... 
I said earlier, there's a difference between having water in you, a well in you, and having a river flowing out of you. And at salvation, we have the Holy Spirit. But I want you to think another step here. There's more than just that. Whenever you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, he has you now. It's not just I have the Holy Spirit. He now has me. And that's when he's leading. And when the Holy Spirit leads, the children of God are revealed. When the Holy Spirit leads, the kingdom of God is shown in its authority because he's leading. If you're leading it, if you're squeezing out fruit, guess what? It's all you, and it's rotten fruit. The Bible says no good thing dwells in your flesh. Your righteousness is filthy rags. Like, you can try to look spiritual, but we can see through it, right? Have you ever seen someone you're like, I know you're saying the right thing, but I know you, right? It's not about the flesh. It's God in us that needs to be free around us. So what, what needs to happen? I'm in the next three minutes with this. And we're going to give you an opportunity on Friday night here. We're going to go through this. But Scripture teaches us that when Jesus said the Holy Spirit's in you, disciples, and now go wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you, just leave it. It's fine. It's meant to be. I did it on purpose. Whenever he said, wait for the Holy Spirit, he'll come upon you, he said, he'll make you witnesses. That moment is whenever the baptism, that just means immerse. That means jumping into the pool of the Holy Spirit versus having him in you is what changes everything. And I'm telling you this because here's, this is just from my heart to yours. I just want to share my heart for a second. I know serving God from both perspectives. Without the Holy Spirit, baptism, and him leading my life, I love Jesus, but he, he wasn't leading, and it was hard, and I got burned out easily. But I also know what it means to serve God after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, it changes everything. We have seen over the years, even with, uh, we've had people in this church even share, uh, that just grew up did not believing in that. Just saying, wow, that's weird. No, you saw weird people. That's not weird because God, he shows himself the way he shows himself. And, and uh, Lisa even told us, she goes, man, everything changed. When my life really began to change, yes, I was saved. But when the power to serve God, the enjoyment of serving God changed is from that moment right there. The moment I said, Holy Spirit, all right, you're in charge now. And from that moment, just like in Acts 2, all throughout the book of Acts, we see the power to live for God. If sin has been reigning in your life, it's because you've been trying to produce the fruit of you because the Holy Spirit hasn't been leading you. You want to be like Jesus? Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he will now have free reign to produce fruit in your life. But he doesn't just produce fruit. That's within you. He also produces power on your life. And I don't just mean power like a healing evangelist power. I'm talking about favor, open doors that no man can shut. He can do things that the natural says is impossible. How did you end up there in that job or in that situation? Only God can do that. If you're led by the Spirit, He'll lead you in victory. Always. Doesn't mean you don't go through the valley of the shadow of death, but He leads you through the valley of the shadow of death, always to victory on the other side. Why? Because God's plan always comes to pass. It can't fail. So you don't want to have failure in your life? Do it God's plan. Do it His way. Be led by the Spirit. So what are the two things we uh, happen when we're baptized by the Spirit? And I want to tell you this now because I was going to wait for next Sunday to do part three, But on Friday night, we're going to have a worship night here, and we're going to pray. And I want you to come on Friday night and just say, hey, you know, I want want to just see what this is about. I want to see what my life looks like with the Holy Spirit leading my life. On Friday night during worship night, we're going to have that opportunity. It's not going to be weird. We're not going to do weird things to you and, and, you know, hang from the chandeliers or anything like that. We're just going to let the power of God reveal himself and change lives on Friday night. And the Bible says, uh, the first thing is we receive the language of heaven. Now, I, was, I went to Baptist church for many years in my life. I went to Methodist church for many years and uh, Sardis United Methodist Church. You know, and the, and the, I don't, it's not called a priest. He's a pastor, but he wore that, I just remember that real colorful robe, you know, and he spoke with a British accent. I don't know why it just sounded, I mean, he wasn't, he was like country, but he had to preach in a British accent. I was like, man, that sounds really cool, actually. Other accents sound more anointed. I don't know why. But anyway, so, uh, but I don't know how you grew up and what you think about this, but we're just going to have to let the Bible define our lives. The sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was all, Acts 10, 44. Listen to this. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell, here's the key word, upon those who heard the word. All right? He works within us, but this is upon us. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Now, verse 46. How did he know the Holy Spirit fell upon them? Verse 46. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. 
Now, let me just help you out because y'all are like, golly, how did we came for a baby dedication? We got this weird sermon. We're going to be praying in other languages. I don't I've seen other people do that. I, I mean, I know people that went to church and they actually taught them how to do it. And they're like, say, this is not a joke. Come ride on my Honda, but real fast over and over. <laughs> Training. How to pray. Come ride on my Honda. Come ride on my Honda. Come ride on my Honda. Come. Oh, I'm praying in tongues. No, that is not what the Bible says. So you might have had all kind of, I'm trying to just negate all these thoughts for a second. And Paul even said this, don't get up on stage and, and, and everybody start praying in tongues and people come because people come in, they're unlearned, they're not going to know. If that happens, interpret it. Otherwise, it's to build yourself up in your most holy faith, the book of Jude says. You want power spiritually? You got to be praying in the spirit. Paul said, I pray in the sport more, more, more than everybody. He knew. Why? Because he operated in a higher level of power than the whole church. And he said, because I do this. It's how you charge yourself up. So the Bible tells us over and over again, the Holy Spirit came upon them, they spoke with tongues and magnified God. What is that? You're not just saying something that's supposed to go, oh, that's weird, that's cool, is that God? You're praying God's perfect will in your life. The Bible says when you don't know what to pray, Romans 8, the Holy Spirit prays through you the perfect will of God. And let me just tell you, we don't know what to do most of the time in our lives. We're, we're ignorant of a lot of things as humans. We don't know the whole picture. The Holy Spirit perfectly positions our lives and prays the, the will of God through our lives. You might have said, man, I know you said you're a, a non-denominational church, but you, you're not like other ones here. We're going to do it God's way because we want God's results, okay? And I'm telling you, if we're Light's church, what we're about to step into as a church, the change that's coming, we can't fulfill our purpose being religious and trying to just be more religious than the next person or the next church and hope we win the world. The church has to do it God's way if we really want to turn nations upside down. This is how we do it. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you receive the language of heaven, and we'll go into that another time. And you also receive power to be a witness. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will get power. That word power means special ability that is above the natural realm that humans can't have that only God can give you. That ability or power will enable you to do things you couldn't do before. You want to be victorious in your walk with God, you need this. Some of you are not as passionate of God. You might think, why am I not hungry for God? Pastor always says he spent this time with God and God told him this. And you might have asked, how come I don't hear God like that? I remember being that person. How come I don't have that adventure with God? How come I don't have that hunger with God? Let me tell you, it's because you don't know the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm saying that in all honor and love. And I don't know who I'm talking to. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit's leading you, you're mature as a child of God. You get results. If you're leading your own life, you don't get results. You want to have fun serving Jesus? You want to get results? Let the Holy Spirit take over and lead your life. So on Friday night, we're going to have a worship night, and we're going to do that. We're not going to be weird, but we're going to let God be God. And I'm not going to fake it. I don't, yeah, I got tired of that. I was like, I, I'd seen that too much. I'm like, that dude, he's just pushed three people over with their eyes open, and they were scared. He hit his head, and he's got a bump on the back of it. We're not doing that. We're going to say, if God's God, let him be God. All right? Hey, in my marriage, God, you're God, you have it. It might not look like how I think it should look, Lord, but you're an authority now. You're responsible. My children, Lord, they're yours. Dedication. My car is yours. My job is yours. My future is yours. Surrender that to him. Let him do it his way. And guess what? It'll never be your way. His way is always the way you didn't want him to do it at the timing you didn't want him to do it. And it always works out later. You go, God, I thank you for doing it that way. You'll recognize that. So the Holy Spirit needs to be active in our lives. Let's all stand up, if you would. All the series I'm doing right now, every Sunday, it's not just random. In prayer, the Lord has shown me what's coming and what we're going to be experiencing as a church. I believe we're living in the last days. It could be 10 years, 100 years. doesn't matter. I'm living like it's tomorrow. But... If God has chosen us to be the most significant generation on earth to potentially usher in the return of Christ, then we got to be about our Father's business, and we can't play church. we got to get results. And so I'm going to preach on whatever it takes for us to be prepared for what God's about to do, and we're going to have fun with Jesus. There are so, I am seeing the biggest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. Imagine taking place, taking part with the greatest revival and harvest of souls the world has ever seen in all of human history all at once as the church. I mean, church isn't going to look like you think it's going to look. It's not like, let's just make our services better. Church is going to be wherever the body of Christ goes. Your neighborhood, 
you don't need to hope you can get them to church. Bring the kingdom or the church to them. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I just pray that you take the words I spoke today. Lord, reveal them to your people as your word and not mine, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would just strategically uh, just cut away and do surgery in our hearts, remove the uh, mindsets and the attitudes and the ways of looking at things that have prevented some of us, Lord, from ever advancing and maturing in our walk with you. Lord, I pray that today you would reveal yourself. Holy Spirit, show yourself to your people, Lord. Lord, you said that uh, you're a good father, and if we ask you for the Holy Spirit, you will give us the Holy Spirit, Lord. So right now, just all of you, no one looking around, every eye closed. I'm not going to call you up or anything like that. But the Bible says that in, in Luke 11, that if we ask our Heavenly Father for the Holy Spirit, He will give Him to us. That's it. Don't have to push you over. Don't have to do anything weird. If you want to operate in a higher level in this season, let me give you a testimony with your eyes closed. Somebody came up to me last Sunday, didn't know I was starting a series on the Holy Spirit. Just shows you how God's strategic. I didn't tell anyone but Pastor Tony... I was, uh, and Vicky, I was doing a series on the Holy Spirit, and I've t- neither one of them told this person I was. This person came up to me and said, I feel like I need to share this with you. And they've been in this church for a while, and they were even at our worship night last year whenever we prayed for people to receive nothing and hadn't received anything. Ask God for the Holy Spirit. They said they're driving to work. Now it's not last week, it's two weeks ago because this was last Sunday. And uh, listening to worship music and just worshiping God, singing along. And all of a sudden, and this person is not like overly churched in this. It's not like they know. How, it's not like, oh, yeah, this is how you do it. They're like freaked out by this and said, I'm driving to church. And all of a sudden, I just feel God's presence. And I just start saying things that I thought I have lost my mind. And they begin to just pray in the spirit, had no idea what they were saying. Still don't. I asked him this morning. I want to make sure I get the story right. He's like, yeah, it was weird. I didn't know. I'm still thinking, was that, what was I doing? Am I nuts? You know, but he had asked Holy Spirit, God. I want the Holy Spirit. I don't want to just have you. I want to be in you, Holy Spirit. I want to be baptized. And they just started praying the Spirit on the way to work and told me, they're like, it was the craziest thing. I have no idea. Not weird. I didn't sell him holy water. I didn't put a green cloth on his forehead and slap him three times. Why? Because God is God, and we just have to get out of the way. And now he said, I've never, my life has been transformed. I'm telling you, the power to serve God comes at that moment. So if you need help, I mean, you ask God now, let him have that story. I've had people say in this shower a year later, I was like, why did I mess something up, God? And all of a sudden, God does it when and how it needs to happen. But on Friday night, we're going to give you an opportunity as well. Father, I thank you for your people. Lord, I'm just taking extra time here because there's nothing more important than this. Lord, I pray that they would find their place in these last days in the church of what you called them to do. Lord, I thank you that no one, even a guest today, maybe they've never heard anything like this, Lord, I thank you that you're already revealing to them that this is truth that they're hearing. Lord, I pray that the hunger and the desire to walk with you and to fulfill your purpose for their life would be insatiable, Lord, that it would just take over their thoughts, Lord. Lord, I thank you that none of us can go back the way that we came and just back into the just, just you know, doldrums of life after this. But, Lord, we know there's so much more for us. And, Lord, we don't want to be trying so hard to serve you. We want it to be a natural byproduct of serving you that we look like you. Jesus, have your way in our lives. We give it to you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. Amen.